This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229 MRI signals and sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The 15th lecture, Magnetization and Preparation Part 2, focuses on diffusion and is broken down into three parts, and Lecture 12a covers diffusion, spins, and MRI signals. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to understand that the MRI signal is sensitive to diffusion, to appreciate the relationship between random walks, diffusion, and MRI signal attenuation, to describe the dependence of the MRI signal on the diffusion coefficient, and to recall the spatial and temporal scale of diffusion in biological tissues. You may recall from one of the earlier lectures that we provided a comprehensive description of the block equations, which is shown here. This is a complicated set of coupled partial differential equations that include processional terms, transverse relaxation terms, longitudinal relaxation terms, and at the time we ignored uh, the effects or the potential effects of the diffusion term. And while there's complicated ways of developing the mathematical um, uh, implications of the specific diffusion term, uh, we won't use this lecture or this lecture series to specifically delve into solutions to the, to the block equations with this diffusion term, but we will give you some insight as to the effects of diffusion on the spin system. And importantly, what you'll learn is that spins are thermodynamically driven to exchange positions. Of course, that's a function of uh, having a non-zero temperature uh, and, and moving around as a consequence of uh, the Randall, random thermal motion. And this exchange is irreversible, and it can lead fundamentally to signal attenuation. And in fact, we can design MRI experiments to be more or less sensitive to diffusion. And it might be helpful to think ahead about applications, but in general, changes in proton self-diffusion, or the self-diffusion coefficient, which we can measure, those are generally an early biomarker for cellular disruption. So let's begin by considering diffusion as a 1D random walk, where the step size of the random walk is delta x, and the step time is, a, uh, is delta t. And from a given initial position, there's a probability that the spin could move either rightward or leftward, and this probability uh, of, of moving either to the right or the left is the same and equal to one half. And this presents a, already an interesting notion. Note that this is a non-Gaussian distribution, right? This is a binomial distribution where spins can only move to one uh, or another position. We can write some simple MATLAB code uh, to generate uh, 1D random walks, just stepping through uh, a for loop to increment the position as a function of a random variable. And you can generate plots just like this one using the code above, which will give you uh, the impression that the spin can move uh, in a somewhat random configuration, uh, bouncing around as a function of time. Now, it takes quite a bit of work uh, mathematically to develop uh, this concept further, uh, but we can, in fact, define the probability distribution for a spin, that is, what's the likely position for a spin or family of spins uh, after some period of time. And this gives rise to the one-dimensional partial differential equation that describes uh, the diffusion process. And in fact, we can obtain solutions to this partial differential equation uh, by considering all the positions, all the spins uh, lying at a particular position, say the initial position, at, a, at, a, at an initial time, time zero. And the result of this uh, fundamentally non-Gaussian underlying process gives rise to a Gaussian process at the population level, that is, the probability distribution for all spins. Uh, and what we notice is that the probability distribution is dependent on the diffusion coefficient and time, and it has this uh, Gaussian looking term, uh, which will be uh, more apparent later. This of course can be extended to two dimensions, in which case we could have random walks, uh, or random steps either to the right, the left, up or down, in which case the probability of any of those likelihoods uh, is reduced uh, from, from one half in the one dimensional case to one quarter in the two dimensional case. And of course, this can all be extended further to three dimensions. So we can simulate the two-dimensional random walk, and we can see that for a group of spins, they'll essentially be spreading out as a function of time. And in fact, we can carry out these simulations for different temperatures uh, as well, because the diffusion coefficient is different for different temperatures. And this may be important for experimental work that you might be doing at room temperature for some conditions, as well as at body temperature for other conditions. 
And what you might notice between these two uh, diffusion random walk simulations is that the step size is a little bit larger uh, at higher temperatures because you have more thermal energy driving the spin uh, uh, position updates. Um, and of course, as a consequence of having a larger step size, the, the distribution of spins at the same end time uh, is, is larger or broader. Now, of course, these simulations can also be extended to three dimensions, and we can derive, finally, a three-dimensional probability distribution function that helps describe mathematically what's the likelihood of finding spins at various positions after uh, various uh, um, uh, durations. And so this is just a cloud of uh, three-dimensional random walking particles that's representative of the diffusion process of protons in a spin system. So that probability distribution function is, uh, of course, fundamentally describing how spins uh, move through space as a function of time. And we can compare, for example, what we call free versus restricted diffusion. In the case of free diffusion, water is moving through an otherwise isotropic media and perhaps uh, uh, has a, a uniform distribution or likelihood of moving in either the x or y direction. So we can look at the histogram of the positions of these particles as a function of time. And we can see that the broadening of the histogram in the x direction or in the y direction is actually quite similar. And that tells us that the underlying diffusive process is quite similar in the x and y directions. And we'll learn later that we can sensitize the diffusion experiment in MR to a particular direction. That is, we can measure diffusion coefficients in the x direction, or we can measure them in the y direction, or in fact, any possible direction that the gradients can sensitize us to. And so in the case of free or isotropic diffusion, the, the uh, spins can uh, equally move, uh, move equally well in either the x or y directions. And so the probabilities of those two events, or those two dis distribution functions are the same. Now, in biological tissues, it's, it's common, of course, to have so-called restricted or anisotropic diffusion. And in this case, as a consequence of the underlying cellular architecture or microenvironment, the spins may have a higher likelihood of moving in one direction than another. And in this case of an elongated cardiomyocyte, uh, just as a sort of ad hoc simulation, we can see that the spins have an easier time, that is, a higher diffusion coefficient along the long axis of this cell, and have more restricted diffusion uh, sort of in the perpendicular direction. And if you imagine hundreds or even thousands of these cells populating a pixel of interest, um, then the, the uh, apparent diffusion coefficient would then be anisotropic because of the underlying uh, microstructural differences, say, in this case, in the uh, y and x direction. And again, the diffusion MRI experiment can be made sensitive to diffusion in the x or y direction, and consequently we can estimate or learn about diffusion coefficients in different directions uh, and fundamentally understand something about the organization of the microenvironment compartments uh, and its underlying anisotropy. Uh, more typically, uh, I think it's safe to say that diffusion of biological tissues, it can be free or isotropic, but in most tissues it tends to be restricted or anisotropic. Now, these Gaussian distributions of spin positions can be characterized uh, mathematically by a variance, uh, that is the, uh, the width of the Gaussian curve is related to um, uh, the diffusion coefficient. And in the case of free diffusion, we can see that the variance of these two distributions would be the same, and the diffusion coefficients that we would estimate would be the same. And so uh, from a diffusion perspective, uh, these would have similar uh, distributions and variances. However, of course, in the restricted or anisotropic case, then we expect the diffusion coefficients would be uh, different. And because the diffusion coefficient, uh, there's, there's less variance or, or a lower distribution of spin positions after some period of time, uh, in the x direction, then uh, we can infer uh, that the diffusion coefficient is lower in the x direction than it is, than it is in the y direction, for which the spins uh, have an easier time uh, moving greater distances in the same amount of time. So again, fundamentally, the variance of spin position is directly related to the spin uh, to the diffusion coefficient, and we can um, uh, link these concepts uh, to observe uh, momentarily. Uh, that signal attenuation will uh, uh, then be tied to the diffusion coefficient that we can estimate. So let's uh, take a step back and recall how phase uh, is imparted on a spin. Uh, of course, uh, we're used to thinking of gradients being applied as functions of time. Uh, 
and the gradient activity dotted with the uh, spin's position uh, or the spin's history, which could in fact be the random walk itself, will give rise to a particular phase for a particular spin. And so there's a clear dependence of the phase that the spin stores uh, and the underlying spin history, uh, which we don't control, uh, uh, but it also depends on the gradient waveforms, which we do control. And so we'll learn uh, in the subsequent lecture uh, the kinds of things that we can control about this gradient waveform to impart more or less phase onto the spin system as a consequence of spins that may or may not be undergoing a random walk. So let's compare what happens to a stationary spin that stays here, say at isocenter, and a diffusing spin that's moving around according to a 2D random walk. We could, for example, play a bipolar gradient, a large positive gradient waveform followed by a large negative gradient waveform. And we can track each of these spins uh, either, you know, through simulation, for example, to look at this, the phase evolution. And we can see that for the stationary spin, we accumulate some phase as a function of being in the presence of the gradient. Uh, we hold that amount of phase in between the two gradients uh, when neither is being applied. And then the second bipolar gradient effectively undoes the amount of phase that we had. Again, that's specifically for the, spa for the stationary spin. Uh, the spin that's undergoing a random walk, of course, will accumulate a various amount of phase depending on its position. And because it's unlikely to return uh, along a an identical path during the gradient history, um, the spin will accumulate a net amount uh, of spin. Uh, a net amount of phase, rather. And so stationary spins don't accumulate phase under these conditions, but diffusing spins will definitely have a non-zero phase. Now we can also take this one step further and consider an, an ensemble of spins, dozens, hundreds, or even millions of spins. And an ensemble of diffusing spins will accumulate different amounts of phase because each of those spins will have visited a different position history uh, during the measurement interval. And the larger the phase dispersion at the end of the diffusion encoding gradients, that's indicative of having a higher diffusion coefficient. And the more phase dispersion we have, uh, the more signal attenuation that we'll have. If all the spins are pointing in different directions, we could have some, you know, very, very large uh, signal drops or uh, attenuations. Uh, whereas in the case of stationary spins, all of those uh, spins would, of course, have a non-zero phase and maintain a strong coherent signal. In general, the longer and stronger these diffusion gradients are, uh, that will contribute uh, more sensitivity to diffusion. And so we'll think about in the next lecture how we design these gradient waveforms to maximize or design for sensitivity for diffusion. Now there is an expression that links these concepts together. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this lecture to work through the derivation, uh, but it is ultimately a relatively simple expression. And so the diffusion weighted signal, the signal that we can measure with MR using an imaging sequence, for example, depends on, uh, uh, of course, some signal uh, effects that are uh, absent the diffusion effects. So there may be uh, uh, additional signal weighting that comes from T1 and T2, for example. And then that depends on uh, the native signal intensity and uh, uh, the variance of the phase distribution, which is more uh, intuitively captured by a product of what's called the B value and the diffusion coefficient. And what's important to remember at this point in time uh, is that we begin to see how the signal that we measure can be dependent on the diffusion coefficient itself uh, and some underlying um, uh, uh, parameter that we control called the B value. And the rest of this lecture will explore a little bit what this B value uh, 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 actually is and how um, in the next lectures, we'll discuss a little bit more how we control it and use it to measure things like the diffusion coefficient. So what is the B value? Let's look at some simple examples of this expression uh, on the bottom here. So here's a plot of, the, uh, of this expression. Uh, and we're just thinking here in the case of, say, maybe simple free diffusion. And so we can choose the diffusion coefficient for water. And we can plot the signal intensity ratio, that is uh, the, the measured signal normalized by some background signal, as a function of B value. Now again, for now, just remember that the B value is something that we can control through the design of our gradient waveforms. And so we can think of a simple example. The diffusion coefficient of water is about 3 times 10 to the minus 3 millimeters squared per second uh, at 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, 
recalling that uh, uh, it's the product of the of the B value and the diffusion coefficient in the exponent here, we know this needs to be unitless. Uh, and so it doesn't surprise us then that the B value would have units of inverse diffusion or seconds per millimeter squared. And that's a good thing to remember uh, in terms of keeping track of uh, uh, the, the, both the units and the magnitudes of uh, the components. And so we can just do some simple thought experiments and think about what happens to freely diffusion, diffusing water after 50 milliseconds. Uh, and in that case, about 32% of the spins have moved more than 17 microns uh, in that short period of time. So it's good to help us have some intuition for the scale of uh, spin movement. Uh, and similarly, about 5% of the spins have actually moved greater than 30, uh, 34 microns. And so they'll have a pretty rich, you know, sort of history of exploring their local space. Uh, and again, as a consequence of their underlying path and the product of the gradient waveforms, that will lead to a phase or an ensemble of phases that can um, uh, uh, lead to signal attenuation. So for a typical B value, which is about a thousand seconds per millimeter squared, uh, the water signal can be attenuated 95%. And so we see this in the plot on the right, which is just a plot of the normalized signal as a function of B value, where B value is something we control. And in this case, the diffusion coefficient of water is used. So if the B value were chosen to be 1,000, then you'd actually have substantial signal attenuation relative to, for example, having no diffusion encoding gradients turned on. And a big part of designing the diffusion encoding experiment will be the amount of diffusion sensitivity that you want, uh, that is, the, how big or small a B value you choose, uh, and that will have implications on the amount of signal attenuation that you have, uh, which of course competes against the, the noise uh, floor. Uh, so we have to carefully pick uh, our B value according to the diffusion coefficients we might expect for a particular experiment, and maybe based on something we know about the, the noise or sampling for, uh, for a particular experiment. Uh, of course, we could map out different curves. So here I've just mapped out two more curves uh, suggesting uh, what this uh, signal attenuation curve looks like if the diffusion coefficient is less than water, that is uh, slow diffusion. And if you have slow diffusion or slower diffusion, then you have less signal attenuation as a function of uh, B value. Or you could in fact have diffusion coefficients that are higher than water, in which case the diffusion uh, the uh, signal attenuation would drop more steeply as a function of B value. Now, in practice, uh, for biological systems, we don't typically encounter uh, the condition where the diffusion coefficient is less than that of water. Uh, we're typically adding uh, barriers to diffusion. Uh, uh, sorry, rather, we, we do encounter this condition because we have barriers to diffusion. We don't typically have diffusion coefficients that are substantially higher than water. That's uncommon. So let's look at some specific examples uh, and ask maybe why is 1,000 seconds per millimeter squared a typical B value. Uh, this is common across most of the neural literature in particular. Uh, 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 that B value is, is kind of chosen for a specific anatomical territory. It's different for the liver, for example. Uh, so here we have a, um, a table of diffusion coefficients for white matter, gray matter, and CSF. And we can see that there's a reasonable range here where CSF is close to the diffusion coefficient of water, which perhaps makes sense to us as a largely, uh, uh, say, ionic solution with some uh, loose proteins in it, uh, compared to soft tissues, which have much more restrictive environments because of the underlying cellular and extracellular architecture. So here, uh, we, we think of an example of, say, white matter, where the diffusion coefficient might be about uh, 700 uh, millimeters uh, squared per second, uh, and the uh, uh, for this particular B value and this particular diffusion coefficient, uh, we find that the, um, the loss of signal, the signal attenuation is about 50%. And so when you're looking at exponential curves like this, uh, you don't wanna to be too early in the curve where you have no differences in your uh, compartments as a function of uh, diffusion because the diffusion sensitivity is very low. But if the B value is very, very, very high, you also, have, you also lose diffusion sensitivity because there's so much attenuation of all species. And so it's, uh, as with all things in MR, it's about picking sort of an optimum value uh, that would give you uh, sensitivity to differences in diffusion, uh, but also keep you from competing against uh, the noise floor itself. So how do we acquire diffusion-weighted images? That is, how do we use these principles of uh, signal sensitivity to diffusion in imaging? Uh, 
Uh, for that, we'll turn to the next lecture. So click the links below uh, and join us for that. Thank you.